Välkommen till Inside Israel från internationella kristna ambassade i Jerusalem. 9 april sände NRK ett nytt brännpunktprogram. Denna gång under titeln Observatörerna. Här presenterar de arbetet i de så kallade observatörerna i Hebron. Eller mer korrekt, TIP. Temporary International Presence in Hebron. I dette programmet kommer NRK med sin fortelling om hvordan jødene er overgripere og arabere er offer. Du skal straks få se at, se at NRK hevder at jødene bor ulovlig i Hebron. Men selv erketerroristen Yassir Arafat erkjente legitimiteten til det jødiske nærværet i Hebron da han signerte Hebron-avtalen i 1997. Hebron är er den enaste byen där olovliga israeliska bosättningar är er mitt inne i byen bland palestinerna. Slik så Hebron ut då de första ultraortodoxa judarna intog byen i 1968. En arabisk by med livliga gator. Snart växte den första olovliga bosättningen på västbredden upp här. Hebron ligger helt söder på det ockuperade västbredden. Först bodde alla bosättarna i utkanten av byen, efter vart flyttet flere in i selve bykärnen också. De lever i små enklaver som vokser och gör livet till palestinerna vanskligare. Gator och butiker är er stängt och området är er underlagt israelsk militärkontroll. Hebron är er hellig för judarna. Här ligger patriarkenes hule där Abraham och hans familj ska vara gravlagt. Han är er jødenes, men också muslimenes stamfar. Det gör konflikten betent. Det är er virkelig historieforfalskning när NRK fremstiller det som om jødene först kom till Hebron i 1968. Särskilt när arkeologer och historiker hävdar att det har bott jøder i denna byen nästan kontinuerligt genom 3800 år. Hela Hebron är er på omlag 20 kvadratkilometer. 18 av dessa är er så kallade H1-område, hvor de palestinska arabiska selvstyremyndigheterna har kontroll. Men 2 kvadratkilometer är er det så kallade H2-området under israelsk kontroll. Jøder har ikke adgang till det palestinska arabiskt kontrollerade H1-området som alltså är er 18 av de 20 kvadratkilometerna av byen, men det bor omlag 30 000 arabere i det israelsk kontrollerade H2-området. Araberna har därmed tillgång till begge delar av byen, mens jødene bara har tillgång till en liten andel av Hebron. NRK undlater i tillägg och fortæller att sedan etableringen av oslo har jødene blivit angrepet hundrevis, kanske tusenvis av gånger av araberna med allt från knivstikning och skytning till bomber. Vi har också varit i Hebron. Här ska du få se en reportage som vi lagde för någon få år sedan som presenterar information som inte passat in i NRK:s fortelling. Can you explain to us, David Wilder, uh, what this place Hebron is meaning to the Jewish people and the Jewish roots here? Well, the roots of the Jewish people are, are right here, right where we're standing. Right in back of me is the Tomb of the Patriarchs. This is the site that Abraham purchased almost 4,000 years ago. We read about this in the Bible. And it says very clearly that Abraham bought a cave to bury his wife Sarah. And we have no doubt whatsoever that that site is right behind us. Okay, the building, of course, on top of those caves is 2,000 years old. It was built by Herod, but underneath that are the caves of Machpelah. And those caves are the second holiest site to the Jewish people, not only in Hebron, but in all the world. And when we talk about roots, of course, it's not only the roots of the Jewish people, it's the roots of all of monotheism. This is where the belief in one God started, right here. And from here it emanated throughout the entire world. You know, the word Hebron, in Hebrew, it, me, it comes from the Hebrew root, lechaber, to join together, to bond together. <coughs> this bonds all of the people together, starting at one site, at a very holy site, right here. Um, so you see, what we have here is really fascinating. We have 
we're standing in between two walls. This is a wall here that today you can see from the bottom going up, today is about three meters high. It used to be 10 meters high. So it's probably about as high as the building, okay? This wall was built about 4,500 years ago. Now, 4,500 years ago, we're going back to the days before Abraham. We're going back to the days of Noah and the flood, okay? From the flood. This wall over here is a little bit newer. This wall is 3,700 years old. It goes back to the days of Abraham, okay? But what is really fascinating here are these beautiful stairs that we're walking on because these stairs are also over 4,000 years old. They led from the valley below, coming up. And the archaeologists think that right at the top is where the gates to the city of Hebron were. And if they kept digging there, they would find the gates. The person who was coming into the city would come up. Whoever was up top could see who was coming and decide if they wanted to welcome the visitor or not. And if they did, they'd open the doors and they could go in. If not, the gate would remain shut. But what's fascinating is we can see, you know, it's amazing to think who walked on these stairs, okay? But if we stand here and we look up, we have to keep in mind when we read about how Abraham bought the caves of Machpelah for the Jewish people almost 4,000 years ago. So it's written in the Bible very clearly where he made that transaction, where he gave Ephron the Hittite the 400 silver shekels and signed the contract. That site is, of course, the gates to the city. And right above us is the gates to the city. It's very, very possible that that's where Abraham stood and purchased the caves of Machpelah almost 4,000 years ago. And in my mind, what's really, really amazing is the fact that there is Abraham then and here we are today. We're still here, 4,000 years ago. And again, when you want to talk about our roots, the roots of Judaism, the roots of monotheism, it's difficult to get closer to those roots than where we're standing right here. I mean, this is it. The Jews have several times throughout their history been banished from the city. Can you explain for us? Um, in truth, uh, for almost 4,000 years, Jews have been here uh, almost continuously, with a few exceptions. Um, one of those exceptions goes back a thousand years. Uh, you know, there were uh, holy wars in Hebron. Even this site, the Tomb of the Patriarchs, uh, there were times when it was a synagogue, and then it was turned into a basilica, into a church uh, in the 300s. And then the Muslims came in in the 600s and turned it into a mosque. And the Crusaders came here about 1100. And from 1100 until 1260, Jews were banished from the city. In 1260, the Marmelukes expelled the Crusaders, and a, uh, a, a Marmaluke emp emperor by the name of Biberus came here and, uh, and, and he re-established uh, the presence in Hebron, a Muslim presence in Hebron. Um, but uh, from 1100 to 1260 there weren't Jews here. Seven years later, the same Biberus uh, declared this to be a mosque and from then until 1967 it was off limits till we came back. Uh, the last time that there weren't any Jews in Hebron was basically between there were riots here in 1929, uh, and at that time Jews were expelled from the city following the riots uh, from the summer of, of, of 1929 until 1931. På begynnelsen av 1900-tallet var det et velfungerende fellesskap mellom jøder og arabere i dette området. Denne fredelige sameksistensen tog slutt da den britisk støttede muslimske lederen stormuftien av Jerusalem, Hay Amin al-Husseini, oppildnet muslimene til angrep på jødene. Dette var foranledningen til at de arabiske innbyggerne i Hebron angrep sine jødiske naboer lørdag 24. august 1929. Et øynevittende forteller. Det var sabbat morgen, og jeg så hundrevis, kanskje tusenvis, av arabere komme mot huset vårt. De ropte og skrek, Itba al-Yahud, slakt ned jødene, og andre grusomheter. Da massakren ble avsluttet, hadde 67 jøder blitt slaktet ned, og mange skadet, og jødisk eiendom ødelagt. De overlevende jødene ble tvunget til å forlate Hebron. En liten gruppe kom tilbake i 1931. Det var omkring 25 eller 30 familier, og de var her til sommer av 1936. Etter Passover, i spring av 1936, Mufti Amin al-Husseini igjen begynte å incite, 
and the British said to the Jews living here, we can no longer protect you, and they expelled them, threw, threw them out of the city in the middle of the night in their pajamas, but they didn't let them take anything with them. And from 1936, about April 1936, until we came back in June of 1967, there was no longer Jewish presence in Hebron. Places in Hebron has been bought by Jewish people throughout the history. Can you explain? Look, Abraham, it's written, paid 400 silver shekels. There was a man named Ephron the Hittite who owned this. And Abraham wanted it, and Ephron said, no, I'll give it to you. It's for free. And Abraham said, no, I want to purchase it. Now, you know, I compare it to if somebody came to you today and said, here are the keys to, to a new BMW. Take it, it's a gift for me. And you say, no, nah, I can't take a gift like this. I'll give you a check. Come on inside, I'll write a check. You've got to be crazy. Why? Somebody gives it, you take it. But Abraham said no. He said he wanted to buy it. And 400 silver shekels, you know, today 400 <laughs> silver shekels today in Israel is worthless. It's worth $100. But a study was done, and a professor came to the conclusion that 400 silver shekels in the days of Abraham is in today's currency worth $750,000. So you can imagine what it was worth then. Why did Abraham buy it? Why was he willing to put so much money down for it? because he knew that the site was so holy that if he didn't purchase it, then one day somebody was going to come back to him or to his children or to their offspring and say, you know, we let you use it. Sarah had died, you had to bury her, but it doesn't belong to you, it belongs to us now, give it back. The only way that you can make sure that something remains with you forever is if you sign a contract, put money on the table, and then nobody can say it doesn't belong to you. You know, there are three places in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel, where it's written in the Bible that we bought. We paid money for Joseph's tomb in Shechem, we paid money for Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and we paid money here in Hebron for Maharat HaMachpelah, the tomb of the patriarchs and the matriarchs. What are the three most controversial places today in Israel? Joseph's tomb, which was destroyed. The Arabs took it from us and destroyed it. Temple Mount, where it's almost forbidden for a Jew to go up on the Temple Mount, it's in, in any case, according to Jewish law, people should not just walk around there. But in the perimeters around there where it is permissible to go, I'm not allowed to go and say psalms or to say a short prayer because that might offend the Arabs who are up there, the Muslims that are there. And of course, here in Hebron, Marta Machpelah, this site where we're standing right now was off limits, not only to Jews, but also to Christians for 700 years. We were told that we couldn't pray here because it was a mosque. And Jews could pray outside, but they couldn't go inside. Only since we've returned in 1967, again, does anybody who want to worship at such a holy place, do we have access to the site? And our neighbors tell us that if they should ever control the site again, God forbid, that we won't be able to pray here. They say it's a mosque and only Muslims can pray here. And when people say, why do you live here in Hebron? We know that if we didn't live here, not only wouldn't I be here, but you wouldn't be able to film this because you would not be able to be here and none of the half a million people that come to visit this every year would be here. Okay? And uh, so the purchase, uh, there's a, a, a saying that our sages have, 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 have said many, many thousands of years ago that there are three places that none of the nations of the world will ever be able to say we stole from them. Joseph's tomb, Temple Mount, and here the tomb of the patriarchs because we paid money for them. Also later in the history, Jews have bought uh, land here in uh, Hebron. Oh, of course, of course. We've bought much property here in Hebron. Where my office is, is land that was purchased. Uh, it had actually belonged to a Jewish sect going back probably a thousand years ago. Uh, but the, the land was bought by, by Jews there in the year 1540 and lived there for almost 400 years. And down the road a little bit more uh, is uh, Tel Hebron, where Abraham lived. And that's land that was purchased in the uh, early 1800s. Uh, there was much land purchased here in Hebron over the centuries. Uh, and of course, much of that land was stolen from us. And uh, today we have tried to regain it, reclaim it, and renovate. Uh, in some cases, we've been successful. In some cases, no. In 1968, you uh, just moved into the city. Yes. Uh, can you explain uh, the story here? Look, we came back uh, in 1967 during the Six Day War. We came back here in 1968 uh, and started to set up different neighborhoods. Of course, Hebron is the only Jewish city 
in all of Judea and Samaria where there are actually Jews and Arabs living together. Mm. But we live uh, basically in separate neighborhoods. Uh, in this neighborhood here, uh, in uh, Tel Rumeida, there are uh, uh, Jews and Arabs that actually live across from one another. Uh, where I live down the street in Beit Hadassah, uh, actually my next door neighbors, there are also uh, Arabs. And uh, there was a time when we would <laughs> wave at each other. Um, but, uh, but that was actually the beginning of the return to Hebron where Jews had lived for literally hundreds of thousands of years. We came back to our homes. How is the security situation and which threats are you facing today? Look, uh, 11 years ago, in January of 1997, Hebron was cut into two parts. Uh, the Palestinian Authority was uh, given over 80% of the city and we were left with uh, less than 20%. Uh, part of the area that wasn't given to them were the hills that you see in back of us. And when these hills were uh, abandoned, uh, we, we warned that they would shoot at us from those hills. And unfortunately, that did happen. Uh, that shooting took place for over two years. Uh, it finally ended uh, when the Israeli army went back into the, the uh, cities that we had uh, abandoned to them. Uh, and uh, today, there's a little bit of shooting sometimes. My own apartment was shot into a few months ago. Um, and fortunately, there was nobody home and nobody was hurt. But, uh, but there still is a tremendous threat if those hills should ever be uh, transferred back under the control of the Arabs here in Hebron. Uh, there's very, very heavy security here. The uh, army and the other security forces work very, very hard to try to make sure that the, uh, the terrorists are, uh, are, are kept away from us. They try to, of course, apprehend them and make sure that they uh, are not able to perpetrate terror attacks. Uh, sometimes terrorists do get through. There are also many terrorists that leave Hebron and go into other cities in Israel, like Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or wherever, to perpetrate terror attacks also. Um, uh, and perhaps the most important element, of course, is, is divine assistance. Okay? In Hebron, you can feel the hand of God. I mean, it's there all the time. Because if it wasn't, then God forbid uh, uh, we could face a tremendous catastrophe. Uh, and that, that divine element is uh, perhaps the key to our existence here, together with the security forces and the faith that people here have. Can you explain what has the Oslo process done to uh, U.S. Jews here in Hebron? You know, um, a, a friend of mine that I work with uh, when he's faced with that question and they say, what's Oslo? He says, it's a curse. My reaction is a little bit different. When you say, what is Oslo? I say, it's suicide. Okay, we took our security as the state of Israel and put it in the hands of our enemies. And as a result of that, there have been, um, I don't know, 15 or 1600 Jews that have been murdered, killed in cold blood by terrorists, many of them who were armed by the state of Israel and by the United States and by the Europeans in hopes of peace. And the only peace that we had was not peace as I spell in English, P-E-A-C-E, -E, you know, a secession of war, but peace, P-I-E-C-E, -E, one piece of land and another piece of land and another life and another life. And uh, we still face that situation up until today. The continuation of Oslo were the Hebron Accords. And of course, uh, that culminated with what happened uh, almost three years ago in the summer with Gush Katif being uh, abandoned. And uh, now we know that uh, rockets are being fired from, from Gush Katif, from the land that we gave them into our cities. They're hitting Sterot, they've hit Ashkelon, they have rockets that can hit further north, they can hit Ashdod. And uh, this is a tremendous, tremendous tragedy. Uh, when, when, a, when a people takes its security and puts it in the hands of your enemy, who is your sworn enemy, who says time and time again, we refuse to accept your existence, we're going to wipe you off the map, then of course uh, uh, the, the results are catastrophic. My visit to Hebron goes to the end. Right before me visualizes all this conflict in a nutteskal. Down the gate, a Arab in the middle of the night with Israeli soldiers, in this is the city that is controlled by the Israeli army. Nogle hundrade meter härifrån är gränsen till det område där de palestinska arabiska självstyremyndigheterna har kontroll. Där som en jude beveger sig in dit är han i livsfara. So you see we have here in back of us a roadblock. Um, this area in behind me was transferred to the Palestinian Authority. And you see the Arabs can go on both sides of the cities. They can go from here over there and from there over here. 
I can only be here. If I go over there, then they will kill me. Okay? And you also have here many left-wing activists that come from all over the world, as this woman that's standing in back of us, uh, who uh, come in here to incite against us and to try to help the Arabs. And their goal is, of course, to try to push us, the Jews living here, out of Hebron. They regard this as a Palestinian city and see us as, us as an enemy force. And they help the, uh, the Arabs in Hebron very, very much. Første juni vil vi igen invitere til storsamling i Kongeparken Amfi ved Ålgård utenfor Stavanger. Vi har i år fått med oss en rekke kjente talere som Kallgrim Berg, Ketil Solvik Olsen, Arnfinn Klemmensen og Steinar Hanneland. Musikkinslag vil være ved Teis Bernt Sandvik, og Katrine Huvernes. Senere på sommeren vil vi invitere til ICJs sommerkonferanse 2013 i Kristiansand. Denne går av stablen fra 27. til 30. juni, og hovedtaler er Malcolm Hedding. Jarle Valdemar vil være med og ha aktiviteter og barnemøter, og Arise, ICJs ungdomsavdeling, vil ha et eget opplegg for ungdom mellom 15 og 23 år. Gå in på www.icej.no for mer information og påmelding. Velkommen! Hjertelig velkommen til Fakta for dig med ICEJ. 16. februar 2012 uttalte tidligere utenriksminister Jonas Gahr Støre følgende til Stortinget. Jeg mener fortsatt at kjernen i konflikten er okkupasjonen. Med andre ord, det er Israels kontroll over blant annet Judea og Samaria, kalt Vestbredden, som er kjernen i regionens konflikt. Disse områdene kom på Israels hender i seksdagerskrigen i 1967. I henhold til vedtak i Folkeforbundet 24. juli 1922 er det Israel som har rett til disse områdene. Men vi lar den siden av saken ligge denne omgangen. I den norske Midtøsten-debatten har den feilaktige påstanden om Israels ulovlige okkupasjon blitt et mantra. Sånn sett føyer Støres uttaler seg inn i et kjent tankegods i den norske Midtøsten-debatten. Men stemmer det at det er dette konflikten dreier seg om? Nei, det gjør det ikke. Da ville det jo vært fred før 1967, før Israel fikk kontroll over disse områdene. Men det var det ikke. Det var krig mot Israel og massive terrorbølger. Så dette resonemanget, ja, det stemmer ikke. Tvert imot, etter seksdagerskrigen i 1967 tilbød Israel betingelsesløse forhandlinger med araberne for å oppnå fred. Svaret kom på det arabiske toppmøtet i Khartoum høsten 1967. Der uttalte de følgende «Nei til forhandlinger med Israel, nei til anerkjennelse av Israel, og nei til fred med Israel». Det er denne uvilligen og egentlig dette hatet mot Israels blotte eksistens som er kjernen i konflikten i Midtøsten. Hadde det ikke vært slik, ville jo Israels ensidige tilbaketrekning for Gaza i 2005 vært med på å skape et klima for fred. Men det har jo ikke vært tilfelle. Tvert imot brakte det tusener av raketter mot Israel og mer ufred. Besøk oss på vår webside som du finner på www icej.no Der kan du lese kommentarer, daglige nyheter, du kan se våre TV-program, høre våre radioprogram når det måtte passe deg, og også lese undervisning fra Guds ord og fra Bibelen om Israel og det jødiske folket. Der kan du også gi en gave til arbeidet vårt. Det kan du også gjøre med mobilen din. Da kan du skrive en tekstmelding hvor du skriver icej.no 
mellomrom, beløpet, og så sender du denne til 2377. Takk for at du står med, og Gud velsigne deg.